Hi, my name's Dave and you're listening to episode 74 of On The Bench, the podcast for scale modelers, by scale modelers, all about scale models. And this episode is being brought to you through the generous support of Kevin Kentner, Chris McLean and Cody West, who have joined our Patreon team. If you'd like to become a supporter of the show, you can do so by going to www.patreon.com forward slash on the bench and pledge any amount from $1 upwards. Your support will help us with the production of the show and is greatly valued. The Scale Modeler Supply Lacquer Paints are a new and exciting range of paints specifically designed for the Scale Modeler. SMS paints have been formulated for airbrush use on a variety of scale model mediums, such as plastics, resins, and even metal. Being designed for airbrush use, all the guesswork with thinning ratios has been completely eliminated. All you need to do is give the sturdy glass bottle a good shake and then simply pour and spray. And of course, being an acrylic lacquer, they are tough much tougher than water-based paints and are very fast drying, giving you more time at the bench. SMS paints have a massive range of colours to choose from that will suit any scale model, including Gumpler, car, science fiction, aircraft, military and even trains. And did we mention they also do a variety of weathering products, brushes, tools and accessories? Go and check out the full range and find your local stockist by typing in scalemodeler.com.au or simply punch in SMS paints to your search engine. And hey, great news if you're in the US and Canada, SMS paints are now available through usagundamstore.com. So give SMS paints a try. I know you'll be happy with the result. And welcome back to the podcast. G'day, Ian. G'day, Dave. G'day, G'day, listeners. G'day, Julian. Hello. Dave's back. Dave's back. (laughs) Dave is back. (laughs) It's been many, many weeks. Well, it has for us because we pre-recorded the last two episodes. Correct. So this is the first time we've been back in the studio for about five, six weeks. Yeah, about six weeks. It's quite a bit, yeah. Yeah. But first of all, we have something to play with. Those... Whiskey sipping, banjo plucking hayseeds from Kentucky, Michael and Dave. When I got back from a trip around the world, there was a little um, package waiting for me, and it was Woodford Reserve Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. Mm, so we've got yeah. our we've got our glass of ice, and Ian's about to crack the bottle. Oh, and are, gonna, are, are they going to pay out of, on you for having the ice? No, you can have ice you're on watering whiskey. it down and no. all that sort of hoo-ha. It would Some have people been, are purists, you know. It, it, it would have been worse if I had a had uh, Coke. Whiskey, oh, whiskey oh, Coke. Ruin it with, with Coke. <laughs> Couldn't think of anything worse than ruining whiskey with Coca-Cola. Oh, absolutely. Yucky. So we're about to uh, try this and imbibe it a bit. You might just want to use this knife just to crack the top there, mate. Uh, actually... So apparently this is uh, made quite close to where Michael lives, and we're talking about Michael and Dave from uh, the Mojo podcast. Yeah, Modelling Mojo. Modelling Mojo podcast, yeah, how could I forget that? And um, they, he sent me across this one. He got, he, he's actually got a better one that he reckons, but he couldn't sort of get it shipped out here, so... Um, and when you pop that, you've got to have it real close, close to the microphone, because I want to hear the, you the hear cork that? come out. All right. Oh, is that the sound of it uh, flying off and hitting the ceiling and putting a nice little dent in it? <laughs> oh, oh, that sounded good. <laughs> there you go, Dave. You can have the honours and pour it. Right. And what I've decided to do, seeing Ian won the Musaru Cup, he gets to take this home with him. Oh, sorry, Julian, a bit too much for you. Yeah, I do have to drive and I've already had yeah, a beer. Yeah, me too. <laughs> take it easy. How's that? How's that? Yep, perfect. Not beautiful. Not to mention on the way to your place. The police <laughs> love to camp out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. So, cheers, fellas. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Cheers. No worries. Cheers. Ting, ting. Oh, that's a good drop. 
Oh, that mm. is nice. That is a good drop. Oh, that is nice. Mm. So, as I said, seeing Ian won the Mooseroo mm. Cup, I've oh, gifted yeah. this to him. Thank you, guys, and, and thank you, uh, Dave. <laughs> hey, that'll carry, that'll carry him really well. <laughs> Be a few good nights sleep out yeah. of this bottle. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I had the best time while I was overseas. Yeah, from what right. I heard. Absolute best time. I got treated so well when I was in Canada. It was great to catch up with Stuart Anthony and Anthony. And I'll tell you what, where they have their um, club meeting at the Canadian Warbird Heritage Museum, what a place. It was absolutely awesome. An, an actual club meeting in a in an aviation museum. Yes. Huh, that's pretty cool. I mean, isn't that brilliant? That's pretty cool. I mean, well, oh, geez, they're so blessed mm. to have that. Mm. And, you know, and the museum looks after them and obviously the club looks after the museum. And yep. It's a real yeah. sim, symbiotic yeah. sort of relationship. Hand in hand. And it it's ideal, so isn't it? Oh, absolutely. If only we had that sort of thing here, you know? Well, we do, but we don't have, like, it, it, they've, they've got a, a room there in which they can actually, the boys can actually have yeah. their meeting. And and then when they have um, like their competition, the uh, museum actually moves aircraft out of the way so they can put display tables up and everything, which is just absolutely brilliant. It is good. And I was well looked after by Alan Mural, and um, he took me around and got me inside a um, Catalina. Catalina, which was awesome to crawl all the way through mm-hmm. a Catalina. I've never done that before, so I was thrilled to bits. And also crawled into a um, torpedo bomber, a... Um, Avenger. Avenger. Oh, God, it's awesome. Had the best <laughs> time. The best time. And both those aircraft fly too. Which, yes. Which adds an extra kick to it as well. Mm. I mean, the Lancaster was sitting over in the corner. She was going through her winter maintenance and... Um, Did you notice the top turret? No. What was I supposed to notice about the top turret? The Canadian Lancaster's got a Martin turret. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, ah. it's got, it doesn't have the big bulbous turret, top turret. It's got the more streamlined Martin-style turret. I'd never noticed yeah. that. Oh. I had so much to look at. I was like a kid in a candy shop. Oh, you would have really been, yeah. was. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Too true. And then uh, I caught up with uh, Ian Fraser as well. So Ian and um, Alan were both judges for the Moosaroo Cup, which yep. we won. Cheers, Ian. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> and um, Ian was just uh, uh, both Ian and Alan – True gentlemen in the modelling world. Yep. Really are. And um, after we finished the podcast over there, we went down to their version of a return services league place and uh, kicked on and had a few drinks and yep. spoke about modelling as you do. Oh, fantastic. And it was just awesome. <laughs> and the audience had a live audience out there, mm. which was great. And it was great to catch up and say good day and mm. see people there. It was just really good. Yeah. They had, I just had the best time. I really did. Oh, sounds good, Dave. And then after that, or uh, well, before that, I actually went over to uh, one of their modelling shops. And um, did I bring the card in with me? Wheels and Wings, uh, owned by Don. And uh, when he found out who I was, he just took me for a tour through the whole place from right up the top, right down to the basement level. And, you know, he spent a good hour with me just, you know, talking yep. and showing me through the whole shop, which is brilliant shop. So cool. if you're ever in um, Toronto, yep. drop Go, by and have Pop a in there and have a look. Um, and then so I thought, oh, beauty, so I'll buy some kits while I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so wandered up to the front desk and I said, I oh, will ship it to you. I said, oh, that's cool. I've got no room in my, um, suitcase. In my suitcase. So I got to the front counter and he comes back and he goes, oh, so it's going to cost you about 150 bucks to ship all those kits back home. <laughs> so I could only really choose two. That were, that, were they kits that you can buy locally or? They were kits that I hadn't seen locally. Right. So that's why I was sort of grabbing them. And so I ended up just getting a Bandai, uh, Star Wars. Um, Death Star. Yeah, and a Zeppelin. Yes. In one one forty fourth scale because they both fitted in quite nicely and made the trip home without any damage, which is pretty cool. Yep. Um, went to a, a French model shop when we were in Paris, which was hard to find. And... Um, Look, it was interesting because, you know, obviously his English wasn't as good and my French isn't... Your French is probably worse. <laughs> French is worse. <laughs> worse than his English. Yep. But, you know, he sort of... I, I felt quite depressed after he was telling me about the modelling scene in France. He says, you know, it's... Yeah, it's dead, isn't it? Yeah, that's what he's saying. He says, you know, the, the, if, you, if you want to lose money, he says, he says, try and run a modelling show in France. Wow. Quickest way to lose money. 
But and yet across you know a couple of borders into Hungary and places like that and the place you know Hungary the, Czech yeah the hobby's booming yep. over there so it's really mm. really strange yeah, it's weird isn't it yeah very weird but mm. um, I had a great time really really good time as I said you know hats off to Stuart Anthony um, also Ian and Alan. Alan they just treated me like a king yeah it was great oh, it's excellent yeah it was really good that is so good had the best of times. <laughs> <laughs> So, what else did I do? Um, you know, did the usual stuff. Went to Alcatraz when we're in San Francisco, which is awesome. If you go to San Fran, you've got to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, they've got a fantastic uh, museum ship down in um, Fisherman's Wharf. They've got the USS um, O'Brien, which is a... The Jeremiah O'Brien. Jeremiah O'Brien, thank yep. you, yep. yep which Trumpeter cool. did a 1350 scale. Yeah, it's a Liberty ship. Yep. Um, and also they got a submarine down there, which I can't remember the name of it now. It escapes me. I know people will be yelling at, the, at their phones or whatever they're listening to and saying, oh, it's this, this. But you do know what's a Gato class. Yeah, yeah, 99% sure it's a Gato class. Same one as what's in um, Honolulu. So, yeah. And I've already been to Pearl Harbor and seen that one, so I didn't really <laughs> see the point going through that. Uh, but, yeah, we just really had a really good time. Excellent. Yeah. you got to travel. And, but what really blew me away is a camaraderie of modelers around the world wherever you go. Yeah. You know, wherever you go, you, you're all speaking the same language. You know, even the poor French guy in his shop over there, you know, we still managed to sort of hand sign and yak for a while. <laughs> and he's got a great little shop there. Mm-hmm. He's got a great little shop, a lot of armor stuff in there. Yes. Um, but it was just a camaraderie ship. Well, com- camaraderie. Sorry. Yeah, gee, that whiskey's getting me already. <laughs> really? <laughs> You barely touched it, though. I know I barely touched it. Oh, hang on, I have another sip now. <laughs> well, it sounds like you had a really good time. Well, yeah. we we didn't miss you. Oh, good on you. Thanks very much. We didn't miss you. No, we just kept rolling, didn't we, Julian? We just yeah, kept yeah. rolling, um, mate. I got a lot, we got a lot of more modelling done, I suppose. Yeah, we I've did. seen that. You guys yeah. have been really busy while yeah. I've been away. Yeah, the mm. old buffalo's getting close. Yeah. The but end. I've had to stop it again because I'm waiting now on a vacuum canopy. Because both canopies that come with a kit are no good if you're doing a Dutch one. Oh, okay. Why? Well, the, the US Navy one's got the telescope, telescopic gun sight. So yep. you've got the big oval hole in the front of the windscreen. Yeah. Um, whereas the British one has got on the main canopy, the sliding cap part of the canopy, on the left-hand side, they've, on the first pane, they've got that oval, I think it might be like a pressure release panel in the middle of the, uh, uh, in the middle of the glass whereas the dutch ones didn't oh uh, okay yeah. it's always something there's always something vac form yeah, yeah scare bought, the heck out of me. i know I, I bought a vac form canopy for me and then another kit I, I this what i'm about to say is going to totally sink dave ever getting an interview <laughs> with airfix <laughs> But I bought their 148 scale Canberra bomber, yeah. and it is a piece of garbage. Oh, really? I mean, it is a banana. Oh no! What a banana in a true sense of the word? Yep, it is like every every if if a bit of plastic is longer than an inch long, it's bent. Wow! Wow! And like to try and get the fuselage halves together, or at least try and get the warp out of the fuse. I did end up using a um, big woodworking clamp. Didn't do the old trick of putting it in hot water and then... Nah, but that's too thick. Plastic's too thick. Wow. So it's, yeah. <laughs> Airfix. you got to love them sometimes. This is why I'm worried about your um, Hellcat. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and I still keep buying stuff for it. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, you've been super busy. You finished your Sherman. Yeah. Which looks absolutely awesome. The photographs look... I can't wait to see it in real life because that looks brilliant. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the photos turn out very nice. <laughs> you haven't weathered it at all? No, there's a little bit of weathering. There's like some dusting and stuff like that, but I didn't go I didn't go nuts. Yeah, it looks good like that. I like it. Mm. Yeah. It's nice and clean. I but, like... There's something about a clean armor kit that I'm... Yeah, I, I quite like that. Well, it's, it's not that clean. It's sort of like light, very light weathering, you know, a lot of dust work, that sort of thing. Because a lot of the photos of the French, ta- French, you know, Shermans were, you know, when they're all sort of like presented and painted up, and then they're, they're mm. there and they're in a queue and mm. not really like in the thick of it. Yep. So I just did it. I did what I could see, and, and that was about it. So you finished that one, and the Italian fighter, the um, the CR forty two Falco. Mm. 
That came out very well. Uh, I mean, that 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 kit was um, well, it's an Italieri kit. Yep, I believe. Or reboxing of who was it? Um, maybe classic airframes or some 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 old thing, you know, some old kit. Yeah, I forget who made it. Oh, if, it. if it's a classic airframes kit, it's an absolute no. I'm actually, I'm is it classic? No, no, no actually, no, I think I think I think it's Italieri's own kit. Is it? Uh, I don't know but, what it is because I know the, I've got the classic airframes kit and it's binnable. It is garbage. Wow. <laughs> It is just, yeah, it's not one of their best. Okay. So th- there's no um, um, rigging on that kit? There's a little bit. Yep. Um, so on the outside of the um, the, the final sort of struts, yeah, towards the outsides, okay. there's a little crisscross of, of cables there. Right. Yeah. And then I also replaced a lot of the sort of actuators for the... Um, um, you know the moving surfaces, like yep. the ailerons and the rudder and stuff. That I replaced those with uh, some ringing, rigging as well because they were, you know, poles. Mm. Yeah, mm. rather than wire. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, I, I replaced those as well, and it sort of adds a bit more finesse to the kit. Yep, which it kind of needs. <laughs> <laughs> but the 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 paint job, cause you got that sort of mottled um, uh, camouflage, desert style camouflage. Yeah, right? sort of. It's like a. I had to mix those colors too, which made it more complex <laughs> right so um i had to mix it once and then i ran out so i had to mix a second set and match that to the first set uh, uh, what paint did you use do you remember uh, i used mrp right okay but i had to like you know start off with a, a lot of yellow add a bit of red and then some sand colors and then i sort of got there in the end i was matching to like actual paint chip type stuff so you know on in 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 a, in a photo yep so it's a it's as close as I could get, but it's yeah, whatever. And all that camouflage all done by hand with an airbrush? Um, yeah, it was all done by airbrush. Wow. Um, I wasn't actually too happy with the way the green went down over the top. It's a little bit speckly to, around the edges because I was getting a lot of uh, tip dry issues. Yeah. I think what I might have done wrong is I might have dropped the air pressure down too much. Okay. Because generally when you do like moth type stuff, you drop it down as far as you can take it, right? mm Slow everything down. So and, you, and you thin the paint out so it's nearly yeah. water. Yeah. Well, I did that, but it didn't seem to do enough. Mm. Yeah. So I was getting all these tip dry issues and I was like, Pfft. I don't know, maybe it was the weather. <laughs> I wasn't too happy with it. If I, if, if I, if I was going to, if I was facing it now, I would have like um, stuck with it and tried to make the points on those sort of motley type bits sharper. Oh. Yep. Because I've got like pretty good reference photos and they're really quite pointed, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I won't. Um, it, I, I did it the best that I could on at the time, and yeah. Hey, come up well. Yeah, it looks pretty enough. Mm. It looks pretty striking. I mean, you don't see too many of these things made because it's a, it's a pretty, basic-y sort of yeah. kit, you know. Yeah. So I'm just I'm just playing around with this horrible FX Canberra bomber. Knowing you, you're going to persevere with it, though, aren't you? I will. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And this is, uh, I'm actually living in a, doing a bit of a parallel universe with a modeling friend of mine. Oh, okay. Got a good friend of mine, um, lives over in um, Georgia. Well, and over in the US? No, 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 no. Georgia, you said? Yeah, Georgia. Yeah. Where Stalin came from. Oh, that Georgia. Yeah. Right. And a shout out to my good mate, Andrew Webb. G'day, Webby. Um, <laughs> now, I've been friends with him for a few years now and basically through Facebook and we're both modelers. Hang on, what are you doing living in Georgia? I don't know, he married a woman over there and he's happily living there and working in Georgia. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, he loves it over there. It's a beautiful country. He reckons yeah. the wine is the best in the world, the <laughs> best wine in the world. <laughs> well, that's no good for me. I don't drink wine. <laughs> but he always builds his aircraft with pilots in it and undercarriage up. Yep. Because he donates most of his kits to his local pub, which is, I think it's a pilot pub or something, and they all hang up on the ceiling. So he at the moment now is building a, um, I think it's an OV-1 or a JOV-1. It's the Mohawk mm. from Vietnam. And he's building it um, as a memorial for a friend of his who recently passed away who flew him in Vietnam. Yep. <clears throat> now he's building that with the undercarriage down mm. and no pilot in the seat, which for him is weird. Whereas yes. me, I'm now building an aeroplane with <laughs> pilots in it. And it's like... <laughs> it's like a really weird vibe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Real weird. Oh, dear. I bought some kits while you were away. Dave. Oh, I bet you did. Um, bought bought the kit that beat you. 
Whoa, oh, it hasn't beaten me because I went and bought another one. But anyway, go ahead. Did you buy a second one? Yes, yeah, so I've got two now. You've got two. <laughs> uh, so for the audience, we're talking about the, the, the USS, USS Gambia, Gambia Bay. Bay. Yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes. I bought that with a Flyhawk uh, detail set for it, yep. which cost as much as the kit. Yep. Um, and I got me Motorhead Heinkel 111. Rock on. I'm happy about that. Rock on. Yep. So tell us the story because you, you – I nearly chucked them a dinner when you were telling me about how you found it. Oh, the Motorhead one? Yeah, yeah. yeah it was um, – <laughs> I went to see a friend of mine um, who owns a hobby shop in Hawthorne, and he didn't have any there, so I thought, oh, well, no worries, I'll put one it's on It's Gundam order. Plus. Gundam Plus, yep. yes, Daryl. G'day, Daryl. And so I'll put one down in order as well as when the um, new Revell 32-scale Eddie's Spitfire comes out. And I thought, oh, well, on the way back home, I'll stop in the local hobby shop and – which is just down around the corner from my place, and walked in the front door. And as soon as I walked in the front door, this beam of light shone down on the on the on the top of the shelf, and this massive guitar riff just played. And there it was, the Motorhead Heinkel. Thank you. I'll grab that. Oh, jeez. So when are you going to start that one? One day. One day. Yeah, it's just going in the stash. One day. It's in the stash yeah. at the moment. Oh, very good. Yeah, tell you what, this uh, Woodford Reserve is going down really it's well. It's a really nice drop. Oh, it's nice and Really smooth. enjoying it. Having it over ice mm. on the rocks, that's the only way to drink it. Oh, yeah. Well, should we get into uh, some listener mail? Yeah, be a bit of listener We've mail We've had there. quite a bit. Um, bit of a backlog too, I bet. Uh, there's a little bit. Uh, and because this is across two episodes that... Um, uh, that we recorded were away, so the mail is sort of covering a bit of that. Um, first of all, our good friend Ethan Idenmill writes into us. He says, Hi, Ethan. Hello, Benches from San Diego again. I greatly enjoyed your survey of model kit makers. I'd like to point out, however, that in your discussion of American manufacturers, you missed two that stand out in most hobby stores Polar Lights, which makes most of the Star Trek kits in the US as well as the new 2001 kits. And, of course, Mobius, which, amongst other things, makes Battlestar Galactic Correct. kit kits. I think they point to the more general trend of science fiction kits becoming more prominent in the hobby, particularly in the United States. Best regards, Ethan. And, yes, Ethan, we did miss that. And when There's he said probably we, a few more we missed, too. You oh, know. yeah, but sort of yeah. the major manufacturers. I think I could recall like maybe one or two that um, when we did it, you know, I I remember it didn't get mentioned, but I, I you know, you, the time the time had come and gone. I was like, yeah, I'll just let it go. Yeah, but I'm kicking myself. I don't believe I I can't believe we actually missed Polar Lights and also Mobius because uh, anyway. Well, considering I was building at that time, I was building the <laughs> Polar Lights Godzilla kit. <laughs> exactly right. Oh, okay. Uh, next one is from Chris Wallace, and Chris writes, "G'day." Dave, Ian, and hello, Julian. Oh, and hello, Julian. Yeah. Julian gets a hello. This, this he gets is, a This is worrying. <laughs> I'm a long-time listener and proud on-the-bench Patreon supporter. Thank you very much, Chris. And a scale model builder and blogger from the cold, vast expanses of the Can- Canadias. Is that how you spell it? Canadias? From Canada, anyway. Today's enthusiasm, Ian's modelling misadventures, and Julian's reserve stoicism make for an excellent podcast combination and for an enjoyable drive to and from work. <laughs> reserved stoicism. Yeah, yeah well, you are. Reserved. You're very reserved. You're You'd very be surprised how many people come up to me while I was traveling the world and said, what's Julian really like in real life? <laughs> he's mad, you know. He's absolutely crazy. <laughs> no, he's not. You ever seen Daffy Duck go You're bananas? the crazy That's one in Julian. this crew, all right? <laughs> mean? Yeah, I know I'm crazy. <laughs> I was born that way. <sighs> Uh, Chris continues on. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, you three were discussing amps in the IPMS judging format. Yeah. Well, not a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree there are some great ideas from the amps camp, but there is no perfect system and both have their strong points. There can be a feeling of unfairness when it comes to IPMS judging in that most of the models entered in the contest seem overlooked while judges focus on the top three in each category. However... Challenges at all contests are time uh, and time and volunteers count. There never seems to be enough of the either. Judges ag- agonise and sometimes fight over which models make it to the top. And I've heard of times when the difference comes down between first, second, and third between a coin toss. My advice has always been for all scale models to attend and enter a contest, no matter what they are up against. 
don't be intimidated. Rather, be inspired and learn by studying what others have brought. Strike up a conversation and share techniques and bring your model buddies. Winning a medal doesn't make it better. It will make you better, I should say, and it's just a small part of the experience. Thanks for your podcast and keep up the good work, Chris Wallace. You're welcome, Chris, and thanks for the kind words. Now, Chris also is a uh, not only is he a, a builder, but he's also a blogger, and he's got a great little blog on building model airplanes. So oh. I'll I'll just read it out. So it's www, and the rest is in one word: modelairplanemaker dot com, with the words in capital for model, capital for airplane, and capital for maker. So it's www modelairplanemaker.com and I've got to have a look at it. It's a great little blog, actually. Oh, I'll have to check it out yeah, tonight. absolutely. Mm. Uh, next up, we have Andy Ranch. Ranch, R-A-U-C-H. Roach. Roach. Roach, thank you. Hey, guys, love the show. The last few minutes of the last episode had me laughing for an hour when Julian stated that he wasn't a tool. <laughs> I felt there was a clarification that was needed. Oh, yeah, hang on, the email gets better. I'm sure he isn't, but it made me think of a new segment for the show titled "What's in Julian's Toolbox." <laughs> then I thought a little longer. <laughs> Try to stifle your laughter a little bit more, right? Sorry. <laughs> Then I thought a little longer and decided it's probably best that we never know what's in there. <laughs> <laughs> But seriously, great episode. Very informative for me as I just got back in the hobby after about 20 years. Keep up the great work. And that's Andy from Wisconsin. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. <laughs> Julian thought, mm. So what is in your toolbox, Julian? Lots of things. Lots of tools. <laughs> <laughs> uh, finally, we have a very long email from Edward Groon. Uh, and Edward hails from Mansfield in Texas. And he's also the... IPMS USA National Competition Committee Head Ship Judge. Oh, oh. So this is well worth reading out, and yep. just bear with me. It's uh, quite a long email. Hi, I'm Ed Groon. I'm uh, the IPMS USA National Ship Head Judge. I appreciate your podcast discussion regarding AMPs and would like to offer a few observations. Back in 2017-2018, I began noticing a rise of 3D printed kits and parts. I had added into the 2019 IPMS USA rules several items dealing with this process. 3D printed parts are addressed just as another model part, i.e. plastic, resin, PE, etc. Additionally, 3D kits and parts are not considered scratch built, even if done at home by the designer. Yep, oh, that's fair enough. Mm -hmm. It was felt that there is no manual work done, and what is... What is to prevent the modeler from obtaining someone else's 3D file and printing it at home? Correct. We will continue to monitor this segment of the hobby. So that's his first point. Second point. On your discussion that P is required in the ship model, lest it be considered basic. Noting the increasing number of kits which come with material in addition to the basic plastic in the kit, at the request of several of my regular competitors and judges, we created a single media out-of-the-box ship category. What a great idea. Mm. This is in addition to the high-tech OOB category for kits which come with photo wetch and or resin. The proponents wanted the option of not having to use PE or resin bits in order to play the game. This category has been well received and the number of entrants has steadily risen in the few years since it was implemented. I've urged my fellow head judges to consider something similar. I reckon that's an awesome idea. Mm. Because people can be intimidated with... Um, oh, the photo which for, oh, for ships. absolutely, yeah. yeah. And so this is still encouraging them to build... A ship. ...enter the competition and be judged against other ships that are exactly the same yes. as theirs. You know what comes to my mind when I think of that? Yep. So I wonder if they would... Like an advantage would be to be able to use, um, say, stretch sprue for the railings. Oh, if geez, that's, that'd it, be tough. Ooh, that'd be I've hard. Heard of stretch, is, is that considered modification or not? That, that's a weird one. Well, stretch sprue for the rigging is... Because you could probably get that a lot thinner than you could, like the, the kit part plastic, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I remember the uh, Revell 1 to 350 scale U-boats, the side rails on those things, it'd be, it'd be like having a tr trying to hold onto a tree trunk. Yeah, yeah. They're huge. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Way oversized. 
You probably just stretch brew for the 172nd scale U boats and the 1 144th scale. Mm. That'd probably work. Yeah, but, but I mean, stretch I wonder if that, just a horrible I wonder if that disqualifies it from, oh, yeah. from the outer box. Mm. Interesting question. I'll pose that question to Eddie. He listens, so I know that he'll write him. Um, his third point is, in your discussion of the various levels of AMPS competition, you didn't mention that tracking of one's level of expertise is a function of the organisation. AMPS competition is much smaller, approximately 20% that uh, seen at IPMS USA, USA Nationals. AMPS has to track one's growth across one category only, armour. Fair enough. Correct, yep. The National IPMS USA organisation would have to track the growth across seven or eight major categories. It's conceivable that somebody could be basic in aircraft and advanced in armour. So, yeah, that's one of the pluses of AMPS. You can track the individual and and then they can go up in different categories, whereas IPMS rules, you can't do that because it's simply too large. There's too many people into yep. it. Um, fourth point, um, conversions need to be significant. I have had a competitor who moved the funnel of a USN cruiser 16 scale feet and it was called a different class. Same hull, same superstructure and same guns. Just replacing the guns on your example of the USS England would not qualify as conversion, but it is still a Buckley. Mm -hmm. Rather, take that Buckley and convert it to a John C. Butler class would be significant. Oh, yeah, it's a huge need difference. New bridge house, new guns and yep. new stack. Yep. Question five, uh, sorry, point five. Uh, you were right in the discussion of post-World War II submarines. We have separated submarines as to 1945 and the post-1945 so that we can evaluate the differences between earlier submersible boats with rails and the latter spindle-shaped subs of the current time. Your comments about modern spindle-shaped submarines being the purest form of modelling is appreciated. Wow. <laughs> hey. I'll just stick that further on my cap and continue on. <laughs> it's funny, I, as I said earlier on, I've got a Zeppelin, a 1144th scale. I feel like I'm right back building a submarine, submarine again. again. Yes. <laughs> um, point six. Finally, I agree that AMP style judging is not transferable to IPMS. While the goal of measuring a model against an ideal standard is good, the judging criteria are ill-defined for the genres other than armour. Yep. IPMS USA has just completed the membership survey asking if they wish to keep things as they were or do something else. Amps like had been mentioned. A bit over 20% of the membership responded to the survey with a margin of just two votes preferring something else. The something else proponents have conceded that it would take many years, perhaps upwards of 10, to come up with a set of judging criteria across all IPMS genres that would be acceptable to the members. Thanks for the podcast. Just some things to think about. Come on over to Texas at the end of July for the IPMS USA National Convention. It's an excuse to leave your winter. Ed Groon. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. That was that was really well written mm. and some very good points. And you know what? It, I, I, it's funny because we I was talking with this uh, when I was with uh, in Canada and we we're having a couple of quiet ales after um, the show over there, and. What AMPS and IPMS, look, as long as you understand the rules that your model's being judged under with the IPMS rules, mm -hmm. and of course the same with AMPS, then you know where you stand in yeah. regards to how the model's actually being judged. Correct. Criteria. And that's what it basically boils down to. Mm. So, yep, I fully agree, mate. In fact, I'm going to get um, <coughs> Ian Fraser on the show at some point because um, he really crystallised that in my mind when we were sort of having a couple of like, a, a, a talk about it, so... Yeah. You start off by saying having a couple. <laughs> well, we had, we, had, we had a couple of years, yeah. The first round was on me, the first shout was on me. <laughs> oh, Why not? dear. Why not? Well, that's all I've got for um, our mail. Of course, if you write, write into us um, with any topic, anything, uh, you can send us an email at onthebench64 at gmail.com. And we will do our best to answer it. We shall indeed. And <laughs> but not the answer's correct is another thing. I'm going to have to think about setting up a separate email account for Julian's Jewels, I think. Oh, stop it. All right. <laughs> you need to stop that right now. <laughs> oh, dear. All right, let's have a quick break, and then we'll have a look at what's new in the modelling world. Sounds so. good. <laughs> Fine Scale Modeler is proud to support On The Bench. 
Fine Scale Modeler is the world's most recognised and essential magazine and is available on all good news agents and newsstands or wherever you purchase your magazines. Alternatively, go to their website, www.finescale.com and subscribe to either the print edition or the digital edition. Or why not both? Go now. Go to www.finescale.com Back for a quick break, but before we go and have a look at what's new in the modelling world, I just need to mention that... uh, Hector um, Colon from... Colon, isn't it? Colon, it is too. Gee, sorry, Hector, I get it wrong every time. He sent me a copy of the uh, IPMS USA Butch O'Hare chapter of their monthly newsletter and got to thank him for the That's chapter. a great newsletter, isn't it? Isn't that awesome? Yeah, it's really well put together. I haven't seen a newsletter like this from a club since I used to be in the BMW Motorcycle Club. Yep. That's how good it is. And the BMW it's- Motorcycle Club had a high standard for yeah. newsletters. Um, but Hector goes on and he uh, he does a shout out to all the podcast guys. So uh, the boys from uh, the shed over in the UK, the Likely Lads, uh, ourselves, as well as um, those hayseeds from Kentucky and uh, our friends in Canada. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. It's very good. So thanks for that, Hector. Yes, it's a, a bit of a read through it. It's quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's have a look at what's new in the modeling world. And first off is two new kits from a new company called the Q-Men. Uh, the Q-Men is a brand, spelt Q-Men, is actually a brand from Kitty Hawk. Um, and they've punched out these egg planes is the only way I can describe they them. come with Lego figures. Well, it's the... They, they, they look do like, look... They look like ripoff and, Lego and, figures. And just yeah. an interesting thing, the, the guy who invented the Lego minifig died the other day. Yeah. yeah. Passed sure away, yeah. Yeah. Um, so they've got two kits out. These are pretty much just snap together kits. So the first one is a J20 Mighty Dragon, um, which sells for about 12 bucks US. And it's basically an eggplant of the um, Chinese J20. Which is a copy of the, one of the American fighters, isn't it? Or yeah, pretty close to it. Kind of. And um, the other one is a F35B Lightning II, also in the same price range, 12 bucks. Um, comes with the uh, Blue Angels livery, or you can have it just as a straight uh, camouflaged. You can make it as a straight camouflage one, but you yeah, know, grey on grey. A lot of fun. Just quick snap together. Yeah, little leg planes. Uh, good for the busy get the kids. For get the kids in. Yeah, great idea for the kids. Bring the kids in. Uh, let's have a look now. At what's from Hashigawa? And for February, they have announced in one seventy second scale. A limited edition B-17G Flying Fortress called A Bit of Lace. That's a re-release because I remember Hasegawa released that kit years ago mm-hmm. with a bit of lace. See. So it's not even a, a new scheme, is it? No, no, a bit of lace. That's one of the more, very well-known schemes. Well, obviously yeah. slapped limited edition on it this time. Yeah. Yeah, well, Ask true. more money for it. <laughs> Just Jeez. Um, so if you like your uh, kits in. Do you must be an old kit? Yeah, it has to go B-17. It's been around for a fair few years, yeah. at least 10 years. Do you wonder how it stacks up? Um, From my knowledge, it wasn't too bad a kit. A oh. lot of people I know that built it enjoyed it. Well, oh, there you go. So if you like your uh, B-17s in uh, one semi second scale, that's definitely one to grab. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're also doing in one semi second scale a F-15J Eagle with a female pilot figure. Uh, I don't, I think this is a, a rebox again, but I think that the model female pilot that comes with it is just That's a new, new. addition yep. to the kit. Resin. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, the, the the figure is resin, whereas it's a, the kit's still pretty in good plastic. figure, I guess. Mm. Yeah, but in one seventy second scale, it's not very large, is it? Well, no. it depends how big the figure is. It'll be in proportion to no, well, it's not no. one twentieth scale. Oh, you're right too. So the yeah. kit's in one seventy second scale, and the figure that comes with it is in one twentieth scale. Yeah, you can have a bit of force perspective. Put on a base, a bit of force perspe- perspective. Yeah. Uh, no, oh, like it. <laughs> <laughs> they're doing a release of the in one forty eight scale. Their um, RF four E Phantom two, 
which is a reconnaissance version yeah. of the Phantom that the <laughs> Japanese Self Defence Force flew because they've all been retired now. I like the colours on the Japanese yeah, the, Phantom. The Seaf camouflage, the blue on blue, looks great. You know, that's keeping. And it's got shark's teeth. Yeah. Let's keep their <clears> aircraft in such <throat> pristine condition. They really do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's really. Did I ever tell you, story, you guys a story on the air about uh, when some Japanese ships visited Australia? There was two destroyers and a training ship. And um, because of some contacts, I managed to get on board for a tour. So we had a. He used to be a chief petty officer, but he just jumped ranks and become a first lieutenant or whatever in the Japanese Navy or Japanese Self Defense Force. So we're walking around and I'm talking to him and I said to him, So tell me more about the Japanese Self Defense Force Navy. And he looked at me laughing at, ha ha ha, no, 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 Imperial Japanese Navy. <laughs> <laughs> some things don't change. <laughs> no, they don't. But you know, you see ships from Western Navy or other navies and you know, they've got you know, rust streaks here and there. That, the Japanese ones would just look like they're just straight out of the factory still. Just nice and clean and oh, shiny. they've got that beautiful dark grey to them. Um, when they had a look at the uh, helicopter, which is all painted in white, they were using the um, UH... Um, 60s? Yes. And it was just pristine. Mm-hmm. You know, if you look at heli- anybody who's used to looking at helicopters, you look um, on where the door opens and where people get in and out all the time. There's usually little chip marks and stuff. Not a thing. It looked like that. It this also looked like it straight out of the factory. Yeah. And you know, it come all the way from down, from Japan right across the Pacific, all the way down to Australia, and everything was just in pristine condition. It was amazing. And they didn't bomb us this time. <laughs> Jim's a bit politically incorrect. Sorry, it was just a joke. Of course they didn't. They didn't have any bombers on board. No, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> well, there's actually a Japanese aircraft that flew over Melbourne. Yes, during the uh, World War Two, which yes, is astounding. Little, well, not just Melbourne, that and po- Sydney. Um, Fujita was his surname. Um, Noburu Fujita, I think, was his name. Yeah. That was the I-15. Submarine that launched Submarine, yep. and that, well, let's just say he flew over Brisbane, flew over Sydney, flew over Melbourne, flew over Wellington in New Zealand. All in separate flights and missions, All in separate not at the same flights. time. Yeah, yeah. He was the only Axis pilot to bomb continental America when he dropped a couple of incendiaries in the Oregon State Forest. Oh, did he really? Was in, the, in the middle of a rainstorm, so they didn't do anything. <laughs> Um, and he participated in the Aleutian Islands campaign. This guy was everywhere. And and at the end of the war, like 20 or 30 years after the war, he was actually invited to Oregon. Oh, wow. And so he went to Oregon and he bought his ceremonial sword with him and handed it over to him. And he was very concerned that, well, I bombed you guys. How, yeah, is, yeah, how are you yeah. going to react? And yeah. as he said, the people in, in Oregon treated him like ro- royalty. Mm. He just couldn't get over how well he was treated. Mm. And I think he ended up starting up a, a school for kids. Wow. But, yeah, no, the, the, he was a very accomplished pilot, that guy. And that submarine, too. That submarine went everywhere. We'd well, have to, I mean, because you're launching from a submarine in a float plane and you've got to land next to the submarine and then be winched back on board. And Rip the floats off. Well, we well know the waters around Melbourne down here mm. in Bass Strait, they're treacherous waters. Yeah. Because so, the submarine actually parked off the uh, off King Island. Yeah. And so for him to be able to recover the, 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 and or even land in the water, mm. it was just, yeah, it astounds me. Wow. What plane? Uh, it was a, um, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of it now. Um, Flight plane zero. No, no, no! It's it's one of the smaller smaller ones. Um, Dave? No, nah, not a Dave. It was a wasn't it Dave? Wasn't it? Was it? No, it's a monoplane. Monoplane. Okay. Okay. Um, oh. Was it like the 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 one that um like the George kind of thing, but with the no, floats and stuff? No, like no, it's one? very much smaller. Um, oh, I'm just trying to remember. I'll, I'll see if I can Google it. Okay. Well, um, all right. We'll come back to it later. Yeah, yep. we'll come back. I'll, I'll Google it while you guys are chatting. Sure. Um, next release from Hasegawa, uh, Two Tiny Metro Mates number three replacement face sets, face sets, ivory and blank. I've got no idea what that is. It's two white little robot things with digital clocks for eyes or something. Yeah, basically that's what it is. 
Oh, uh, you can get different uh, decals or stickers with it to change the faces. Okay. All right. You get one, two, three, four different faces, which looks like it's on the spindle so you can sort of rotate it to get a different um, expression on the face. Okay. I don't get that. Yeah, I, I don't either. <laughs> get um, this, though. It's a, ro- it's a motorbike. Well, it's not just a motorbike. It's oh. a Suzuki RG400 early version. So in one twelfth scale. It's a nice 80s bike. 1985, in fact. And these things used to tear up and down the road at a great rate of knots. Um, I think we spoke about this once but once, once before, how um, if you're doing a modern motorcycle, it is have to be one of the purest forms of modelling you could do almost because there's no weathering. There's just nowhere to hide with your build so, of it. I think – I'm not too sure. But, I mean, um, oh, it's just uh – Okay, so you get the mirrors, a chrome. Everything yes. else you got to do yourself. Yes. It's not like an, a modern Tamiya <laughs> kit where they will pre put the metal finish on a lot of the parts. You're on your own here. Well, with the frame, the frame's aluminium, so uh, the mirrors about the only chrome bit would that would be on this bike anyway. So, yeah. And I think fine. Oh no, oh. we've still got a couple more kits for the. the Can you, Ian? Your your Japanese is a little bit better than mine. Kogishu. P P one Y two Ginga, and it's in seventy second scale, which is a real shame because I'd love one of those in forty eight. The Allied, <laughs> just a great looking uh, aircraft. Allied code name code name for it was the Francis. Yes, uh, and again, this would just be a rebox, wouldn't it? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not it sure. Certainly doesn't say it's a new one. Um, in one seventy second scale this time, we have an RF four EJ Phantom two five zero one Squadron final year twenty twenty. Uh, decals and scheme. Yep. So they were reti- finally retiring the Phantoms in 2020. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They've got quite a bit of time out of them mm. and their money's worth. Let's have a look and see what Italy have uh, announced for February. And first off, we have a Scania Streamliner truck, a 143H. 6x2. Uh, it's a Scania truck. Yeah. Yep. Did, you know, that one. Nah, it just doesn't do anything for me. It's not like a Kenworth or a Mack truck. That doesn't excite me. Well, it'd sell well in Europe. Oh, absolutely. Definitely sell well in Europe. Absolutely. And of course, the truck builders will love it. Yeah. Uh, next up, from our friends at Italy, we have in 172nd scale a F14A Tomcat. Again, I suspect that this is a Reebok. I'm pretty sure. It's not telling me that it's a new one. Yeah. Either that or someone else's spruce. No. Another Reebok. <laughs> Good price at uh, 23 euros, though. Um, oh, speaking of euros, we're, we're, I've got to tell you a story in Paris. Oh, okay. So we stop at this cafe in Paris. So I order a um, cappuccino and Michelle orders a wine. The cappuccino was five and a half euros and the wine was four and a half euros. <laughs> Why cheaper you, to drink. You're just cheaper to drink in Paris. <laughs> cheaper to drink, mate. Cheaper to drink. Oh, anyway. Um, actually, the Tomcat, they're providing one, two, three, four, four different schemes for it. So that's quite a bit there that it comes with. So you can make, yeah, oh, one, actually, uh, one's for the Iranian yeah. Air Force or the Islamic Republic of Iran Air Force, I should say. That'd actually be quite a cool one to do. Good luck for them getting parts for it. <laughs> yes, exactly right. That's why they scrapped all the F 14s when they took them out of service. Yeah. So they couldn't, the, the, the Iranians couldn't get the parts. Yeah. Because they were bought originally when the Shah was still ruling there. Yeah, that's right. And they right. were still mm. buddy buddy with the Americans. Although they've done well to keep them flying. I think they're still flying now, mm. even some of them. So, they you are. know, that's not bad. Yeah. Uh, Range Rover Classic in 124th scale. It is your typical sort of Range Rover. Uh, Rover. 1980s version Range Rover. The interesting thing is that uh, there's a big decal sheet that's got about 20 different license plates, or sorry, for at least 10 vehicles are included, which is in, in, in impressive. Yes, all over the all over Europe. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, Range Rover. Yep. In 135th scale, there is the M110, which is basically a self-propelled uh, howitzer used by the U.S., um, During Vietnam, yeah, um, served right into the eighties, I believe. Um, 
if you like your self-propelled artillery, uh, artillery, and I know there's a, there's a special interest group out there do like doing artillery, so this would make a great little kit. In fact, mm. that looks quite interesting. I wouldn't mind getting one for myself. No. Yeah. I wonder what the chassis is based on, whether it's a one-off for the actual... Don't know. I'm sure some of our uh, North American friends could probably educate me on that one. They probably would. <laughs> um, it comes with four different schemes and looks like it's going to be a great little kit. And finally, in 148 scale, um, Italy have announced the A-7E Corsair 2. Oh, it's got the Desert Storm markings where it's got the big Desert Storm written on the top wing. Yep, so uh, US yeah. Navy VA-72, the Blue Hawks, which flew off the USS Kennedy and operated in the Persian Gulf in 1991. And also US Navy VA-72... Uh, Blue Hawks right. as well. Persian Gulf 1991 as well. Yeah. It's different a, schemes. Different version A and version B. Ah, right, of course. Um, version C is the uh, VA-22, the Fighting Red Cox. Which is the grey, grey, grey three-tone scheme. That's a really interesting colour scheme. I like, scheme, I that, like that. looks good. Yeah, so um, you've got you flat got f- gunship grey, you've got dark compass grey and flat light grey as part of the camo scheme. That looks awesome. Mm. Nice. Yeah. And the final one is for a Forrestal aircraft from 88. Yep, in your traditional sort of grey over white scheme, yep. which is great. I've got one of these kits sitting in my stash, actually. I should sort of build it. I don't think it's a Italy one. But I must get round to building it. Well, they call them the slough. Um, S-L-U-F-F. Are you used to call those? The slough. Am I getting confused? Is it known as the last of the gunfighters? Or is that a different one I'm thinking of? I can't remember. No, I don't know. I couldn't tell. Well, that's all <laughs> I've got from uh, what's new in the hobby world. Um, although I did see an announcement from a modelling company about some new tanks that's coming out, some armour um, that does full interior. The T-72... Sorry, T-34. Oh, oh from that, that'd be Mini Art. Mini Art. Mini Art. Yeah. yeah, that looks quite good. I'll yeah, they're going say, pretty crazy with their uh, armour kits at the moment, Mini Art. Yeah. When I saw it, I was interested to get Julian's sort of thoughts on that to see what he thought of it. Well, it's, it's um, well, what was it? It was, uh, um, I believe Robert, our, you know, uh, Russian tank guy yep. we've had on, I believe he said that it was a variant that hadn't been done before, I think. Don't quote me. Uh, so there's so many yeah. different variants of those things. Oh, yeah, like, you know, sort of sub-variants and things. Yeah. yeah. But well, what they were well, one variant sh- is he, where, where, where the whole reason why he's into them is because he fell down that black hole, and it's like you know, <laughs> oh, it's got this turret with this gun and this. Oh, there's like so many different turrets, <laughs> sub variants. Oh. But a blue. Ah, now remember, it was a Glen. Oh, the Japanese plane, yeah, Glen. Okay, there you Glenn. go. There, there you go. go. Just remember. Uh-huh. You were to get to me. <laughs> But the interesting thing about, about the Mini Art one is that they're showing just the CAD drawings at the moment. They haven't actually got... Um, Plastic out. Yeah. But they're doing a full interior for that. It was also... Uh, a, was it a Stuart or a... Or a I don't know, Allied Tank? I can't think of which one it was. Oh, the Grant. Oh, the no, Grant. Lee or the Grant. One of the two. Right, yeah. okay. And that's got the full interior. Right, cool. I think it's the Grant because they, they were used by the Russians. Mm. There you go. Mm. Well, as I said, that's all I've got for watching you. What about you guys? Nothing. I've got nothing new. Um, I thought I saw something about um, uh, Kitty Hawk are bringing out a um, uh, one of the Hokum, the Russian choppers. Oh, no, that does ring a bell. Is, is it, is it yeah. the Hokum or, or Ka- yeah, Kamov? That's a twin... twin um, yeah, oh, well, the Kamov. I mean, yeah. The Kamov. Oh, one of them, yeah. One of those. The, the really well-known naval one. With the twin twin tail and the and the twin. Yeah, well, I mean, that's how they make all of their choppers, right? Mm. I believe it. Yeah, I believe the manufacturer name is Kamov, right? Yeah, yeah, something. How like do you cut a rotating uh, main rotor? Mm. Yeah, something like that. I'd be interested in doing one of those. What I scale? Would, I think it was forty-eight. Nice. Um, I I don't have it on hand, so I, I don't, don't quote me on any of this sort of crap. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I don't like being held to things that I've, I've said offhand, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. but it, I would build one of those. Yeah. There's only a, there was a couple of kits out there for sort of those sort of things, but um, it's not, they're not very good. You, you know? built a chopper before? No. Okay. Oh, once. Sorry, I built a Kitty Hawk. Um, the AH 
one Z. Right. Viper. Oh, I had that turn out good. Oh, I was Kitty Hawk, so it was a bit sort of um, hit and miss. Yeah, it's like it's designed to have like the um, the doors open. Mm. It's like one door on the right and one door on the left open, and um, I had to fill around those because you know there was big gaps and things. Yep. Yeah, and then a typical sort of multi-part fuselage oh, yeah. business that they like to do, and <laughs> like you, you think you think Bronco, mm. o, you, like I think oh, Bronco. Oh, it's not Bronco. Bronco it's Bronco's over over engineers. Oh, yeah, yeah, Bronco, yeah, yeah. But then you go to Kitty Hawk, and it's just a whole new ball game. Mm. They just go bananas with their over engineering. I, I don't mind the, the the surface detail, but um, they're, they're multi-part fuselages, and the fit's not that great. Mm-hmm. And multi-part. Yeah. Is it like a multi-pass? Multi-part. Uh. <laughs> In other news, I couldn't help myself. I bought um, uh, I bought the Roden Gladiator. Oh, really? Yeah. I've got one of their Gladiator. I've got their... Um, That's what everyone tells Swedish me. Every time version. I tell someone I've, I bought the I've kit, they're the, like, oh, I'll go with yeah, I've that. Got, I've got the Swedish one. One okay. that comes with skis and it's got the skull on the side. Well, you'll be pleased now, Julian. I don't have one. Okay. <laughs> Actually, it's Finnish, but it's a Swedish squadron fighting for the Finns during World War Two. Oh, that's very confusing. Mm. Did you have a look inside the box? Does it look it's good? a, it's a yeah, nice looking okay. kit. It's a nice looking kit. Mm. And the it's Gladiators are a nice looking aircraft anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I've got like... Um, so the one you got, is that like the Malta version where you got Faith, Hope and Glory? Maybe. I think it's like sort of you know, like... Uh, like North Africa and stuff like that or something. Yeah, you got to do a Malta one. If you got that one, do the Malta. Do one of either Faith, Hope or Glory. That's really famous. They're the most famous of the gladiators because they basically defended Malta with... That's all they had mm-hmm. against the Italians and the Germans mm. until they got the Spitfire Mark Fives in. Yeah. Yeah, I've read I've read a bit about the Spitfire Mark Fives. In yeah. And flying them off the carriers. <laughs> that was a fun <laughs> job. <laughs> Well, it's better than using the Seafire. They are absolutely hopeless. Oh, actually, no, that's another kit I bought too. I bought the um, Special Hobby um, Seafire 3. Oh, jeez, you're a glutton for punishment. Yeah. What made you buy that? I just like the look of it. It looks okay. great. Yeah. It's got the fleet air arm decals. and Actually, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, it's the yeah. last last British shoot down of World War II. Was it really? Mm. Shot down a Japanese twin engine job? From yes, Italy? correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Seafire did it. Wow. Mm. That's very surprising. Because, you know, the, they lost 50% of the aircraft trying to land them. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the end, you know, this did not, these are... These yeah, are that's when they just went to the Hellcats and the Corsairs. Mm. Because they yeah. knew those things. <laughs> those things are the land. Well, even though the Corsair had a lot of trouble in its early years. Yeah. Well, it's the Brits actually came up with the landing uh, pattern so it could land properly. Because mm. the Americans have scared the heck out of them. And a lot of those aircraft ended up in the Royal New Zealand Air Force, who had something like 450 of them during World War Two. So they had a, they had bags oh, yeah. and bags of them. Yeah, the Kiwi our Kiwi Kiwi brothers they they really really did well from from themselves during the Second World War. <laughs> they did, didn't they? They, yeah. Yeah. they were in places we weren't. Yeah, I know. They were right. Yeah. I suppose since. Well, I, I, I presume a lot of it would have helped that the um, the Americans used New Zealand as their main base. Well, certainly the Marines did, yeah. 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 And so that automatically got the New Zealanders in there and well, wherever actually, the Yanks went, the New Zealanders went. Actually, the Marines were in Melbourne quite a bit too. I, the I First went, Marine Corps. Uh, first Marine Division. Division, sorry, yeah. I ended up, um, where was I? I was up between here. There's a, there's a museum, an uh, armoured museum about an hour and a half north of where we live. And I drove up there one day and I went bush bashing a little bit and down a road and I found a little marker um, for the 1st Marine Division because they actually had their um, bivouac camp up there, up around near Pakapanyal. So that was pretty cool. Where they released a couple of pa- uh, panthers. Oh, how are they going to release? They came back from Guadalcanal absolutely ruined. Yeah, because, but they, you know, they were here before they went to Guadalcanal. No, I don't think they were. I think they went straight to Guadalcanal and they came back to Australia to rest and recuperate. No, oh, I thought it was the other way around. Mm, I have to look at my history of the First Marine Corps. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that some of our listeners would be able to keep Oh, definitely. Well, definitely. It was before we were born anyway. Well, <laughs> for those who don't know, um, there are like rumours of big cats that roam the countryside. We're talking yeah. like panthers and that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, big black cat, And there's photos of them too. Yeah. 
It's it's kind of like a Bigfoot thing around here. Yeah. <laughs> well, in Australia, we don't have Bigfoot. We got Yowies. Well, it's funny in the UK they have their version of the big cats as well. Yeah, and it comes from supposedly US servicemen when they're over mm. there released them when they were yeah. sort of you yeah. know kittens and all the rest of it. So they're out there. <laughs> They're at me. I don't know. I just can't see US troops being allowed to take, you know, Black Panther. Well, first of all, where do US troops get Black Panthers from? Because Black Panthers aren't native to the US. They're South America. They're South America. So it doesn't make sense. No. You're right there. Yeah. I mean, if you had had told me a cougar or a bobcat, yeah, I'd I'd be able to accept that. But. Mm. But then again, it's always, it's always conveniently a black cat because you can't tell <laughs> its size. It just looks like a, a silhouette, right? Yeah. yeah really but then again, we, we took kangaroos everywhere. Yeah. Especially the first world. What you see the photos of the AIF in, in Egypt. Yeah. And there, there's freaking heaps of kangaroos with them. <laughs> kangaroos. They bought the roos with them. Yeah. Don't know what use they'd be. Oh, no. Just the mascot for the for the unit. I suppose for female roo, you could slap a bit of ammo on the pouch and send it up the line. <laughs> I don't know whether you could try to kangaroo to do that. They're no, probably not. They're sort of. What you, 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 you want to train wombats? <laughs> Those things. Those things. I would barrel through anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of which, I saw Midway too while I was uh, flying somewhere over some Atlantic Ocean or some ocean somewhere. Yep. Yeah, it didn't impress me that much. Yeah. No. Look, it was it was good eye candy, and it wasn't as soppy as the movie that shall not be named, but. Yeah, left a lot to be his eye. I mean, because it just focused on the um, dive bombers. Yeah, that's it, yeah. And it showed a little bit about the uh, torpedo bomber squadron. but And with no fighters at all. Didn't, no. It didn't touch on the fighters whatsoever. So, yeah. No, because that's where the ja- – um, Midway's where the Japanese got the big, big scare. That's when they went up against the um, thatch. There's thatch like, and his lads. And, and, and thatch and, and he designed the thatch weave. Uh, and and yeah. before that, the, the, the Japanese had no way of countering that. Yeah. That was just alien way of fighting. The yeah. Japanese was dogfight one on one. Yeah. Not so like, oh, we'll go after this guy. Hang on. I've got a guy on my tail now shooting me down. Yeah. Where'd this guy come from? Mm. And it just, and the, like I said, the Japanese just could not get their head around that. Mm. It just totally broke them. Yep. Yep. Good. Mm. So I bought some other things. Oh, geez, you're still going on about what you bought. Yeah, I've been buying way too much stuff lately. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I've rearranged my, um, like where I keep all my kits, you rearrange your stash. Yeah, and I, I've got. I ended up with more space. Oh, you know how your brain works. Like, let's <laughs> fill all that up. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the the Sonia. See, I'll- I, I, I did so. Julian thinks he's got space in his stash, so I'll buy more kits to fill it. Whereas I buy kits because oh, that looks good. Oh, that looks good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I clean my model room out too, so I can actually walk in my model room again, mm. which is great. Before the last time you came over to my place, Julian, you couldn't walk in that model room. Yeah, there was, there was stuff on stuff the floor. Everywhere. Yeah, now it's all off the floor, all sorted out. So, what did you buy? Uh, so, uh, well, I, I bought a. Um, uh, so there's there's a, a Japanese anime cartoon type series that I really like. That's kind of like Gundam type stuff, but not Gundam. It's got robots in it. And well, I, hang on, aren't all Japanese robots Gundam? No. no there's oh. Gundams and Mechas. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gundams are ones with... I, I read about this. I learnt about so this. Mecha, so Mecha is like the overall thing for like robot vehicles yeah. that you pilot. Right. And Gundam is a sub-variant sub like of that. It's like, it's like a, a, a giant mobile suit. Okay. Is a Gundam. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. So they're like... Yeah. In any case, I bought the... the one of the few remaining kits of it because the series is a little bit old now, maybe yep. 10 years old. Yep. And they, you know, obviously made some uh, things to cash in on at the time. But after that, they didn't make any more. Oh. And I found one on Amazon somewhere and I, I purchased that. And what for was another, that? Uh, huh? What was the kit? Uh, it's, uh, I can't even pronounce the name for it because it's like some... Poopy name, whatever. Um, <laughs> Poopy name. Yeah, yeah. It's, That's a technical yeah. term. In any case, um, <laughs> so I bought that thing for some exorbitant price. And I was like, I need to have it you know, yeah. before it, <laughs> before there's none of them left. I'm just dealing with some weirdo who just happened to hang on to it for like 30 years, and he's now going to sell it for 10 times its price. Yeah, exactly on eBay. <laughs> nah. So I, I'll, I'll strike strike while the iron's hot, and I'll also get it. If I don't get it now, I'll never get it. What was the shipping cost? I, can't, I don't even want to know. Once once I actually, like, it was sort of a shocking amount of money. Mm. And then I just hit buy and then I just, just deleted it from my memory, <laughs> you know. 
It, it can't haunt me if I don't remember it. No, <laughs> yeah. it's true. Um, and then the other thing I bought, and um, so everyone knows the the Witcher TV series. Yes. Very popular at yeah. the moment. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of the video game, which popularized that whole uh, oh, storyline series, okay. right? Because it's originally based... You had books first. Yeah. Then they made a video game. Right. Video game popularizes it, and then they turned it into the TV series. I'm a big fan of the video game. It's one of my favorite video games of all time. Yep. Probably my most favorite video game of all time. And What? You mean it? it's better than Total Annihilation? Stop. Don't... You, you, you step take, back, take step it, back to take the 1980s. Your, you take your thirty-year-old <laughs> games and go sit in the corner, right? <laughs> um, wrong with Total Annihilation? Great no, game. There's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> yeah. but, um, but in any case, I really like this the, the game and uh, this. So the the company that made the game, CD Projekt Red, uh, they actually have uh, a number of like you know merchandise type stuff on on their store, mm. and one of them was a bust, a resin bust mm. for modelers. Yes. And I decided I would buy this. What's the bust of? What character? Uh, Siri. Which is? Sorella or whatever. If you've watched the TV series, she's you know which witch? character. No. Oh. She's not. She's the... She's a female warrior. Sort oh, okay. of thing. Yeah, something like that. Okay. In any case, uh, she's a really cool character in the game. Yep. And I decided to buy the bust of her. And, you know, it's not a very good likeness for her in the in the face, but mm. the, all the so clothes with, is with, with bust, with the scale, is it like C... D, E. Not that sort of bus. Oh, sorry, different bus. Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, in any case. Boom, boom. So I, I, yeah, boom, boom. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> the, 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 it looks like they've just taken sort of like a generic European-ish sort of face. Yeah. And then they've just done all the rest of it because the face doesn't really suit her facial features in the actual game. That's not that bad. Um, it was really interesting when I got it because it came completely waterlogged. What? Yeah, like the it had, it's like it had been sitting in a bathtub or someone's swimming pool for a weekend. What's it made of resin? Yeah, resin. Um, it's pretty. It's pretty nice. Uh, you can tell from the way the you know you can see some three D printing steps in like the hairline. Yep. Stuff like that. Yep. So they've clearly designed it on CAD and then they've three D printed a master and then they've used that to make the resin. Oh, very cool. Yep. It's 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 a nice figure, but. There's some interesting sort of quirky things that I I wouldn't probably wouldn't have seen on any other sort of resin busts or figures and stuff. They've actually cleaned up a seam line that runs across the shoulders, and you can see where they've cleaned it up, and where it rinsed the collar, they've broken a bit off and they filled it back in with maybe resin or something. Wow! Wow! So that's unusual. It's very. And then you look at like the the torso. Yeah. And it's it's beautifully. Th- printed so much detail in there and like the sort of the leather working that goes around in this sort of waistband kind of thing and the and the belt but the belt itself is slightly out of register where that seam line runs down the side oh. but none of the rest of it is so only the belt does that mean the belt was done afterwards maybe it's really weird as to how it's done hmm. it, it's almost like they did like a two-stage casting process or something maybe oh. i don't know wow Interesting. When are you going to start building it, painting it? Oh, think? not for a while yet. I need to work my way up to it. <laughs> so uh, a friend of ours at the club, um, Chris Howells, who we've yep. had on, talking yep. about figure painting and stuff, he recently bought the Scale 75 like special um, acr- like super fine acrylic. Yeah, I bought a box of those too. Yeah, I, I bought one too. So hang on, super oh. fine acrylic what? Paint. It's like acrylic paints, but they come in tubes. Yeah. Like oil paints do. Yeah, and the, and it's like a heavy pigment. Yeah, but it's like silky smooth when you brush it on. Do you water it down or anything? Or yeah, yeah, you can you water got, it down with water, water and everything yeah. like you normally would. You knock it down a bit to they're get like, a bit more. They're like but premium the, acrylic paints. Yeah, the top top range of acrylic paints. What's it called? From the brand, the brand Scale Seventy Five. Yep. All right. Okay. Yeah, and most of their stuff comes in like a regular sort of like bottle kind of type of thing, similarish mm. to. Say maybe Vallejo or something, you know. Yeah, but this one comes in the tube. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And the, and their skin colours, it's just amazing. Yeah, the, and yeah, so um, I can't speak to how well they perform because I haven't used them yet. No, yeah. me neither. But I'll, I'll I'll give them a road test when I get to my next figures. Yeah. I'm not gonna, like I said, I'm not doing any more um armor kits without figures. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we'll see how we mm. go. 
Hmm. Next time I do an armor kit. Yeah. Well, I picked up um, for the Gambia Bay a I can't remember what brand it was, but uh, it might have been it might be Infini, um, but it's the detail set for the aircraft for the one three fifty scale Gambia Bay. You're mad now. Years ago, when I, well, I bought the wide ensign models detail sets for the Yorktown aircraft, yep. which is basically a little seat and a little cockpit tub, and that's it. Mm. These ones from Infini have control columns, <laughs> runner pedals. <laughs> the dashboard actually has the gauges on it in 1 to 350 scale. That's crazy. And it's just, I'm looking at this thing and go, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, wow. This is going to be so much fun. So I saw that when you brought it into one of our club meetings. Yeah. And I, the one thing that got me was the uh, the wheels. Yeah, the, the Wildcat. They even got little brass machined wheels for the Wildcat. Oh, that's awesome. And and, and multiple photo etched part undercarriage. Oh, you're kidding me. So you can do that special Wildcat undercarriage yeah, where yeah, it comes yeah, down yeah. with the bars and everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's diabolical. That's great. <sighs> wow. Awesome. <laughs> well, the only other thing I've sort of got to add before we finish up, although it's going to be a short show, but... Um, um, because I've been actually, well, it's going to be a short show. I've got to be up early in the morning. Cause I'm, Me too. <laughs> I'm being sent off to the fires tomorrow down at Orbost. I get back, first week back at work. Oh, you're back. Good. Off you go. Country's on fire. Off you go again. <laughs> well, yeah, it's. it's. Mind you, the rain we've had lately has knocked a lot of it down. Yeah, well, it's. In, in New South Wales, it's uh, contained all the fires, but the fire down uh, where I'm heading down to, it's um, got into peak country. Oh, and so it's so, going to burn forever. Yeah, it just burns forever and ever and ever. So. Pete, that, that, that burns underground. Yeah, not only that, it, re- it releases huge amounts of... Um, Carbon dioxide. Yeah, absolutely. So, Which the plants would love. Well, I probably would. But, Carbon uh, dioxide. It's plants not good for love. the firefighters. <laughs> no, no, no. So I think it's about 60 hectares of this peat stuff that's burning. So wow. Anyway, so that's my week for the next week. Um, Lucky you. The other thing I forgot to mention is that uh, now the Mooseroo Cup has been and gone, IPMS Hamilton uh, have stepped forward and they have said that they will be choosing the kits and they will be sending the kits to both ourselves and the boys from um, Scale Model Podcast to build. So Julian's been nominated to build whatever kit comes out. Whatever it is. And you'll be competing against Stuart. And then obviously we're going to have to ship that back to yeah. Canada for their next um, Heritage Con. Heritage Con or whatever. And I was thinking, speaking of which, the Heritage Con's coming up very soon, I think. Mm. Yeah. So I was thinking also for the year after, and this is out for the shout out to our friends in England and in Kentucky. Those why, damn hay seeds. Why don't we do a battle of the podcasts? <laughs> that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> we all nominate one person. They've all got to build a kit. Yep. And then we just judge them. But how are we going to judge it? See, that's a hard thing. Oh, uh, we can work it out later after yeah. after this yeah. next round, yeah. next phase. Let's get through the next Mooseroo Cup and then yep. we'll look at the international. Yes. Yes. Sounds right. like a plan. <laughs> okay. Well, that's all I've got. Me too. Ian. Photo Witch is always your friend. Julian. Buy more tools. All right, guys, thanks very much, and we'll be back in a fortnight. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, we hope you enjoyed that show. It's a bit shorter than normal, um, but still, it was a great little show. Don't forget to listen to the Scale um, Shed, which is the Scale Model Shed, which is the three likely lads in the UK, and, of course, Michael and Dave at Plastic Model Mojo. Again, lads, thank you very much for that beautiful bourbon that went so well on the rocks it was absolutely superb and of course our good friends from the scale model podcast Stuart and anthony my name's dave be back with you in a fortnight see you later (laughs) 